All right, everyone, let's get the show started. Welcome to our DevOps office hours. It's October 6th, 2021. My name is Eric Osterman, and I'm leading the conversation. I'm the founder of Cloud Posse, and we are a DevOps accelerator. That means that we help companies own their infrastructure in record time by building it together with your team while showing them the ropes. So if that sounds interesting, head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. For those of you new to the call, the format is very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. So feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you wanna jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by heading over to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash office hours. We host these calls every week. Our call today is recorded. We'll automatically post a video recording of this session to our YouTube channel. So if you enjoy our, co our content and want to support it, please hit those like and subscribe buttons. It helps us out a great deal. So with that said, let's kick it off with some announcements. So uh, the one announcement I'm sure everyone who has read the news and cares about AWS in the past week has seen the announcement of uh, the new cloud control API. Um, out of Amazon. And what this is, is a standardized CRUD uh, interface for all AWS resources. So if you're like me and you've been on AWS for ages, you've seen how their APIs have evolved and they've evolved in every way. Like <laughs> there's no consistency uh, in how those APIs were designed. That's what the cloud control API sets out to solve. And with this cloud control API, uh, they also have released a set of cloud formation, uh, I guess, templates basically that other providers can use to scrape the interface. And that's exactly what Terraform has done as part of this process. So now what, one of the major uh, bits of FOMO I've had over Pulumi has been that Pulumi can just generate um, all the operations uh, supported by the AWS uh, SDKs and expose those to the Pulumi framework. Well, now with Terraform, they can do something very similar. So HashiCorp has come out with a early, I'm not sure if it's technically a pre-release, uh, yeah, version 1.0, 0.1.0 of this, where they have gone ahead and literally scraped all the cloud formation uh, resources here and created the corresponding uh, Terraform uh, API for it. So if we go over here to the registry documentation, you can see that you can access these then by using the new AWS CC provider. So instead of using the AWS provider, it's the AWS CC provider and the interface for that will have changed. And then there's just a big dump of uh, every resource available there. So it's not as nicely organized as the HashiCorp documentation. I'm sure that will come uh, in due time, but the benefit is that you get immediate access to the underlying um, CRUD uh, ability. So like, like it's like something we all probably understand, a uh, S3 bucket, it exposes all the parameters of that. And uh, you know, as a Terraform user, you're simply uh, just creating uh, AWS S3 bucket resources no normal. You have access to the dynamic blocks and configuration. So they're calling nested schema here. So, yeah. Uh, anything to add to that, Vlad, perhaps, or uh, someone else? Surprisingly, no. <laughs> I know you expected me to have an opinion. Oh, I, I like it. It's yeah. really gonna ease up everything. Uh, the folks at Plumier had a really awesome blog post and thread on this. So mm. major props to them. I think HashiCorp was supposed to come out with a blog post. I don't know if they did. I'm pretty sure they did, but I it didn't leave a mark on me. <laughs> but yeah, it's. It's obviously something that's good for Terraform. I'm going to look how it evolves and how this actually improves the developer experience. Like, is this actually going to impact the Terraform users or only the folks that are you, that are working on the AWS provider? Yeah. Because right now, the developer experience of the new provider, as we've all seen in the docs, it's 
not ideal. Like, don't make me dump a JSON in Terraform to configure something. That's not nice. But it's super exciting, and I'm very much looking forward to see where it goes. It's also going to be interesting to see what the interplay will be between managing, you know, 99% of our infrastructure today using Terraform and the AWS provider. And what happens if we start doing some stuff with the AWS CC provider? Are they going to be at odds with each other and conflicting? Um, I'm, I wonder how that plays out. Yeah, two, two quick things I'll say. One, um, it's worth noting that Pulumi actually migrated their core like uh, framework generation um, to using this new API as well. So um, wow. yeah, so they, they were an early adopter of that and they, because they were doing some, some hackery before that was some sort of combo of a bunch of different things, including looking at the Terraform providers to figure out some things. Um, but now they've moved natively to using this um, to generate their, you know, their framework SDKs. The second thing I was going to say is that I, I think it probably doesn't affect the day-to-day -day, like workings with Terraform, um, but it certainly is going to affect the speed of support for you know, for any kind of new service or new feature or any of that kind of thing in the Terraform provider, like that should be instantly available without anyone having to write code when they launch um, a new service or they, they add new feature and functionality, which I think is going to drive people to start using this provider rather than the, the, the existing AWS provider. And I think slowly but surely people will migrate their code over to this provider and deprecate, they'll eventually deprecate their, the original AWS provider. Yeah, it's, uh, it begs the question, has somebody already already registered Terraform AWS CC modules uh, organization? <laughs> Quick, go do it. Um, because now there's gonna be a new provider for that. Uh, uh, Matt, have you seen uh, if they've committed to ensuring that every new feature will be announced together with CC support out of the yeah, gate? That, that's basically they, they, the same thing that does this cloud, you know, the, the cloud API is the same thing that they're, they're using for cloud formation as well. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like a unified way for them to make sure that there's programmatic control over every new feature and functionality and service that they launch. So I think that's yeah. going to be their go forward strategy. I wonder if uh, there's any coincidence between this and the freeze going on, uh, or that had at least been going on at HashiCorp with uh, a bunch of their providers, if they were um, doubling down just to get this stuff over the line uh, as part of the announcement. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's why they said they were taking a temporary pause on reviewing um, you know, any sort of Terraform pull requests. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. But this, this strategy, by the way, is the same strategy that Google uses to generate their provider. They, they have like a code generation. Um, so anytime that they, the Google Cloud has like a new, yeah. um, you know, a new something, it, it generates the, the Terraform provider automatically. So um, pretty cool that AWS has gone that route as well. Yeah. All right. Uh, before I switch, move on, any other um, observations related to this cloud control API? We have a, a, what I was showing here earlier was an internal conversation or a conversation in the Sweet Ops uh, Slack, which is public, uh, where there's been also some summaries of the announcements. Uh, whoever, another, whoever writes the first migration tool between the AWS provider and the AWS CC provider uh, wins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, man. Uh, it just, yeah, it adds some confusion and certainly like, you know, if we go to the Cloud Posse and our ecosystem of modules, that means, you know, so we'll have like, you know, Terraform AWS CloudFront CDN, but, you know, as things evolve, maybe we will need a Terraform AWS CC CloudFront CDN. And uh, I'm not looking forward to managing all yeah. those modules. 
I think that's an implementation detail underneath the module itself. Well, it is there, but it's not in terms of a, a convention. Like this is a uh, this is the uh, idiomatic format for a module in the HashiCorp um, Terraform registry that it should be named. Terraform oh, oh I see what you're primary. saying. Exactly. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Terraform dash primary provider. And in that case, it's been AWS, and it's you know not a question, yeah, but now yeah, now it'll be like Terraform AWS CC and then something. I got gotcha. you. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that is the case that we will have to rename them to that to support the new yeah. uh, provider. And unfortunately, unlike HashiCorp, we don't have the benefit of dynamically generating all the code for all the modules based on the new provider. Oh, well. OK. Uh, Next announcement was a small one um, just that I saw when I was scanning the AWS announcements that there's finally a programmatic way to manage the alternative contacts on AWS accounts. Uh, this has been a pain uh, because you would have to log into the account using the root credentials to do that. And that means you know, doing a password reset and all that hoopla. Uh, the other part of this I just thought was funny of slide. So now your, cent your cloud center of excellent team, because we all have that team, uh, can finally set those security contact emails the correct way. Uh, do, we have a pro do we have a programmatic way of deleting an account yet? No. <laughs> Hashtag fail AWS. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, you, you, but you were the one who turned me on to it, right? There's a there's a funny article about uh, Lam, yeah. Lambda to programmatically delete AWS accounts. Yeah, I actually uh, I actually wrote one at one point too. I told you, and it's just uh, it's just never fun. Yeah, it's ridiculous when you see just how complicated it is. Um, and it involves like CAPTCHA solving and email, temporary credit cards and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And like setting an email address to like SES so that you can programmatically receive the email and confirm yeah. like that you want to do things. Yeah, it's it's nutty. That's like an excellent, you know, uh, job interview question, right? <laughs> Joking. I would never take a job that someone told me to do that <laughs> in the interview. <laughs> Be like, no, thank you. <laughs> exactly. I don't know why. So there was another uh, announcement this way uh, all, this week also that received a lot of attention. I, I'll admit, I kind of just ignored it, and my eyes kind of rolled over. I wasn't. It didn't excite me that much. But then I, I saw some uh, interesting summary in our uh, office hours channel. Uh, about this. So basically, Cloudflare has come out with R2, not to be confused with S3, but it is S3, backwards compatible, API, fully managed by Cloudflare because um, every cloud provider now needs to eat every other cloud provider's lunch in some way. You know, Starbucks came out with breakfast, so McDonald's came out with coffee. Um, so Cloudflare now has S3 storage, but what is actually really interesting or exciting about this and why it might appeal to certain uh, companies is, well, for one, Cloudflare's claim to fame is that they don't really charge for egress. So you get S3 with free egress. And uh, that's a, you know, a, a big value there. What was the other thing here? Yusuf, you had shared some interesting things. So basically, R2 will run across the Cloudflare's global network, which is most known for providing uh, anti-DDoS uh, services to its customers by absorbing and dispersing massive amounts of traffic that accompany the denial of service attacks on websites. It will be compatible with S3's API, so it should be a drop-in replacement if you're already using S3, uh, which makes it easier to move applications and... Beyond the elimination of egress fees, the new service will be 10% cheaper than S3 to operate. So where they're still planning to make their money, of course, is on the storage of objects, just not on the delivery of those objects. And also note that S3 by, by, uh, by itself is not a CDN. So what you have to do is you couple S3 with CloudFront and then pay the CloudFront fees for egress. All right. 
Next announcement would be, uh, ah, I just saw this. <laughs> this is in Anton's uh, weekly.tf newsletter. Uh, it was a post on uh, Amazon's blog on you know, how to deploy AWS config conformance packs with using Terraform. And I would like to add, quote unquote, the hard way. As you can see, it is quite messy and gnarly. So that's why we obviously have the easy way to operate it, which is just a module that actually Matt Calhoun, who's on the call wrote. So here's the easy way to deploy conformance packs with Terraform. And it, uh, yeah, what's, what's pretty cool about it is we support uh, loading the raw YAML from a remote data source managed by Amazon. So it's always current and you can version it here. This is just showing in the example pin to master, but you can version it to your release and uh, deploy that uh, AWS can config conformance back the easy way. This is also part of our AWS config Terraform module, which has a catalog of all the AWS config rules available out there uh, so you don't have to tear, spend, you know, your a month or two terraforming this out because we've done it for you. So like all the AWS config rules uh, for EC2 is one example. And uh, another... yeah, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, I'll just note that, that the, the hard part about deploying those in general is that, um, is figuring out the, uh, the the variable parameters that like how you can pass them in without like rewriting large swaths of the code that because the conformance pack itself is actually in cloud formation um, so you basically like have to like come up with a way to fill in the variables from from taking Terraform inputs and then kind of interpolate them into the into the conformance pack and then deploy it so. Um, it's it definitely was not fun figuring it out the first time, but uh, using the module is really easy once uh, now that we figured that out. So I would definitely say if you're going to work with conformance packs, look at our module. Yeah. Um, and because everyone is reverse engineering the HashiCorp uh, registry API. Well, there's now another service uh, out there providing a private module registry and Terraform state backend. Uh, you know, it sounds like a fun weekend project. I'd be very weary about trusting a random new upstart uh, with my Terraform state and secrets therein, um, especially, you know, if we don't know what the longevity of uh, this project is or really the company about uh, behind it. So I suggest whoever is maintaining this uh, come out and be a little bit more forthcoming about you know why we should trust using this with our crown jewels. Although it would be interesting if some of the better known players that host artifacts and things already um, supported this interface. Yeah, it is a very clean and nice interface here that they're uh, they offer. Yeah looks inspired by Google. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely material UI based. <clears throat> yeah. And let's see, that is, those were all my announcements. Anybody else have any more interesting announcements uh, over the past week? I just posted something from, cross posted something into office hours from release engineering. GitHub supports using workflows, reusing workflows, including from another repo. Oh, sweet. Wait, this is click this on, October 5th. Yeah, click on reusing workflows to actually see an example. I was referring to the one down there, but I assume this is fine. Yeah, if you scroll I'm here, so you should get some examples. Uh, learn more here, this one. Yeah, I don't know if they lead to the same page or not. Looks like they might be. Yeah, that's fine. Scroll down until you hit yellow. Basically, mm. uh, uh, more, 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 uh, uh, even more create a reusable workflow, not interesting. And that's it. So job, nope, you scroll down, up, 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 up. I'll scroll back up. Yeah. Where was it? Stop. Okay. Calling a reusable yeah. workflow. Okay. 
yeah so uses organization name repo name whatever and you can now use that that's awesome oh my god oh my god that's pretty awesome and let's see here Wait, so okay so yeah so this job yeah all right so the this, this syntax is very similar so but what it uses so this is the name of the job uses here i would have expected this to be a list of steps of which one could be using here the, the but, list of steps is in the workflow that it's pointing at. but what if we want to augment that um do we have to then create oh. a sep second job that depends on the first job oh now you want polymorphism Jeez. Yeah, I do. I, you know, <laughs> hey, Git, I, I believe you can do something more or less like that with uh, uh, GitLab and their implementation of it. Yeah, I don't know. So I, I wanted uh, that, but okay. Well, this is at great. Least, this is good timing. At least we don't have to I keep haven't used it yet. I was going to say, at least we don't have to keep copying the same files over and over and over again to different repositories. Like, this will be nice. So limitations, um, yeah. So reusable workflow stored within a private repository can only be used by workflows within the same repository. So that's a pretty consistent limitation. It's true of composite actions. It's true of uh, actions in general that they have to be public or within the same repo, which is unfortunate. But uh, for all you mono repoers out there, no worries. Or people that maintain large. Uh... Or open Public source repos. maintainers like yes. Plasma, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. This is no big yeah. deal for us, but you know what yeah. we are trying to do is deliver patterns for our customers, and it's unfortunate that the same patterns we use to manage Cloud Posse aren't available to customers. Very cool, though. Thanks for bringing that to my attention, Vlad. Uh, Somebody any other... else posted it in release engineering. I don't get the credit. Uh, Okay, who was that? Zach, all right. Zach, of course, Zach's always on the bleeding edge of release engineering. Okay, uh, any other cool announcements? Let's see what's in the uh, Zoom chat here. There's the Pulumi blog post and the HashiCorp post. Um, Andy, can you add those, uh, if you didn't already, to our office hours slot? And let's move on to Q and A. All right. So the first question: Do we still have Michael Jenkins? Or did you have to drop already? We did lose Michael Jenkins, uh, but we'll uh, we'll answer Sahil's question if we can. So Sahil, you're working with AWS CloudWatch, and you want to set up metrics for every SNS queue. Um, to me. Uh, we need to, well, it sounds like we need to first get some more context. It sounds like maybe the SNS queues exist already and you're trying to uh, strap on CloudWatch after the fact. Um, I would say that's not the ideal approach if you can, when you would instead be wiring up uh, CloudWatch together with the code that sets up the SNS queues. So like if you're managing SNS with Terraform, then you'd be deploying the CloudWatch metrics at the same time. I assume, based on your question, that that's not the case. Uh, okay, like I have uh, a number of queues already, and some clients came to me. Uh, are you like you need to set up uh, CloudWatch for every SNS queue? Like there are a bunch of uh, alarms I have to set up. So rather I write some code for it, like there are only fifty, or should I go manually one by one? So, but how did those SNS queues? Uh, come to exist? How did the customer create them? They are created manually, so they don't have any Terraform oh, or nothing. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Yeah, so I don't know. I, I mean, uh, the, the fundamental problem here is that they were created manually. Um, so deciding on how to improve this with automation is kind of moot in my mind. Um, I don't know if there's a data source, a Terraform data source for discovering SNS queues. If there is, that would be one way. Possibly you could add the CloudWatch to it. Otherwise, yeah, you're, you're looking at scripting it or doing click ops. Got it, got it. Thanks, man. Yeah. Anyone else have something to contribute for that one? Yeah. 
I can say that uh, the data source for SNSQ requires the queue name. So mm. probably not that great for, <laughs> for helping this task, this task. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, unless you have, like, there's a startup cost associated with Terraform as well. Um, I don't think Terraform is great for like one-off use cases. Like you got to provision the Terraform state back in, you got to get the IM roles, you got to get the, the scaffolding in place, you got to get the, I don't know where, you know, the GitHub repo established for where you're going to put it. So like, if this is just for a one-off thing and the company is already not really practicing you know, IAC, I think this is the wrong approach to introducing it. Uh, next one would be how to, yeah, what to do if you're running out of uh, IPs in a VPC. Uh, this was asked by Michael Jenkins, who's a regular here, but he had to drop early. Uh, Vlad, you were sharing something before uh, we started the call. You want to continue on what you were saying? Yeah, so the first thing is VPCs now support add, adding additional IP ranges. So you can add, if I'm not wrong, up to five additional side ranges. So mm. five slash 16s. Yeah. It's very well supported. It's easy to do. That would be my first step. Michael was asking something about private link though, and I haven't used that. I cannot comment on it. I've got no idea. <laughs> yeah, anybody have experience um, expanding the IP space by deploying multiple VPCs and connecting them with private link? I mean, we haven't uh, implemented anything like that yet, so I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, that's really not like expanding the, that, that's just creating a separate like VPC and then, yes. And yeah. then like allowing like peering to go between the two of them. Yeah. That, that's which, not which we really have doing any... the same thing. Yeah. But it could be a better best practice than, you know, if you're actually running out of space. He mentioned something about ECS, which I, uh, I didn't follow in, in the beginning. Um, I've had issues where I need to expand a VPC, but I've put its subnet IP blocks right next to something. And because we peer a lot of stuff together, I have to do this like weird expand and contract thing where I create a new subnet with a wider IP space. And then I move some instances over one AZ at a time. Oh, and then I like, awesome. it's super annoying to do though. Um, so I wasn't sure if he was running into just like the limitations of IP space because of something that peered with private link. Um, but yeah, uh, it's totally doable. You just have to do the right order in order to get more IPs. What's, what's, uh, what's not though, maybe that uh, ideal about it is if you're using it together with ECS or something that gets deployed there, now you suddenly need to know, you have the job of scheduling stuff in one VPC or the other is now the you know, developer's job or whoever's deploying that. So I think that if you can stick with the single VPC and add the ranges, and let the, the scheduling in ECS or EKS handle that, it'll be easier to support. Yeah, it, it also just lets you know when you're creating new VPCs, like don't get clever, like take a slash 16 or something. Like there's no, <laughs> like if you can, like, cause then you end up, I mean, unless you're gonna have more than 65,000 IP addresses, like that's gonna be enough for, for almost every organization on earth, like, you know, to, to, to handle that in a VPC. I'll just, I'll just throw a right. hypothetical situation, which I might be in. Uh, if you are using slash 16s when you don't need to, and you suddenly eat up, you know, half of the total 10 net IP space and you're peering stuff together, and your company then merges with another company and um, good luck. I totally don't know about this situation, but from personal experience. Yeah, uh, I've, I've worked in like a, a lot of large organizations and had that happen. The other thing I would say is like, you know, the 10.1 slash 16 isn't, isn't a great one to pick. Like so use some of the like more obscure like ones out there that people are likely not using um, when you, you pick them. And then when you merge with people, you're less likely to have that problem. But then you'll inevitably have a problem where you're using the same IP address with a, a company you acquire or that you are acquired or whatever. Um, and then you get into some like crazy NAT scenarios where you have to talk to each other. You basically just have to like not either one one person has to renumber or you just do like NAT translation between your two uh, your, your two sides of the equation, which you know is messy, but it works. This yeah. I, I've done when there's I've done VPC endpoints um, where I just create a 
VPC endpoint inside of another VPC rather than pairing two VPCs together for two orgs and then an acquisition situation is, which I think is basically natting through a VPC endpoint. Uh, Matt, is that different than what you're talking about? Um, yeah, so like, so like actually doing network address translation through some sort of an appliance where like you address everything as like 10.2 slash 16, but on the other side of that, like where they actually have the hosts, they might have it as like 10.1 something and you're both using 10.1 and then they like translate it like source and destination. They, they translate all your 10.1s to 10.2s on their side or something like that. Um, so there's a way when you're, when you're communicating with that, that you would just have a net. I mean, that's essentially like what a, a NAT gateway is doing for you, like on the edge, on your internet edge. Um, that's basically taking like all your private IP addresses and uh, it's actually doing port address translation, like it's translating all those um, to a, a public EIP where you, the public address is on the other side, but you can actually do that with a whole range of addresses. So you can say like, when I communicate with like 10.2.1.1, it's really gonna get translated on the back end to 10.1.1.1 when it communicates on the other side of the VPC. So um, yeah, AWS you know, doesn't yeah. support that, do they on the net? Not you on the NAT gateway. Like, that, you have to that's use why a third-party appliance. Custom it's, appliance. Exactly. I'm and waiting they, for the blog post about which third-party appliance because I do want to look at it, but I was disappointed when you said third-party yeah, appliance. Yeah, 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 unfortunately. It's either third-party <laughs> appliance or, um, like, if you get sufficient enough, like, Linux hosts, um, you can easily do that with IP tables, um, and they can support, like, you know, 10 gigs <laughs> of throughput each. It's, you know, it's not, it's not great, but it works. I'm afraid now, but if you have a blog post about how to do this in an acquisition situation, I'm positive I will eventually have to deal with this. So feel free to post it. I, I don't have one handy, but I would be glad to to write one. I probably should. I've Ooh, this yeah. Few times. So, so now in the formation of a corporation for startups, the best practice is, you know, incorporate in Delaware and pick, you know, obscure uh, site arranges for your VPCs. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, Eric, I would just add that you you can add a secondary cider range to an existing VPC. You don't yeah, have yeah, to create a second was, VPC. Yeah, that's what just that was that. the. Original. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. the first recommendation. And yeah, I, I do see. Um, uh, there was a comment about EKS. Yeah, that, that's pretty common. Where uh, especially the big companies where they'll have you know very fine grained subnet sizes and then run situations where. Um, Kubernetes will exhaust that subnet range. So the, the idea, there's a comment about EKS and there's, there, you can do secondaries within EKS too. That's true, that is true. So next question is, um, uh, shoot, I forget. Adam Blackwell, uh, you were hey. asking how to resize the PVs in Kubernetes when defined in Terraform. Um, I, I believe that there were new updates uh, two PVs and how to resize them. Uh, but my, my snooty answer was gonna be use EFS as your uh, you know, persistent volume storage. And then Interesting. you don't need to worry about it because it's infinitely, quote unquote, infinitely scalable. You can scale the IOPS. It can be at least as performant as EBS, if not faster than EBS, because um, you pay to play. There's, I'll, um, I'll give a little bit of context. There's uh, only two stateful things that I care about. I was gonna say in our EKS clusters, but uh, that I care about, there's probably other things. Um, and one of them is Atlantis because we still use Atlantis mm -hmm. to Terraform stuff, which maybe that'll change with recent AWS announcements. Um, and I don't care if it gets blown away. It's just stateful because Atlantis is written by Luke and hasn't been modified in a long time and whatever. When I, when we containerized it, yeah. that's how it landed. The other is our GoCD CSD pipeline. Yeah. Um, and I really hate that that's a stateful service because if we lose yeah. artifacts or if the pod restarts, yeah. like then I'll, then the pipelines fail and, and we ship tons and tons of things per minute sometimes. Um, so uh, I, I need that stateful persistent volume. And um, right now it's an EBS volume. I, I hadn't really considered using EFS because I, in a former life I used EFS and I, I, it was too early, um, but uh, it probably could be, but we're using a Helm chart written by somebody else, which probably means I'd have to upstream stuff to the Helm chart to make it support it potentially. Um, specifically Possibly. when I look at like defining the storage class, um, I could have used uh, a dynamic AWS storage class 
but then I'd be worried about accidentally deleting the EBS volume when we muck around with Kubernetes. And so it was more of a safety metric that we defined, decided to define the EBS volume in Terraform and then link to it via persistent volume, persistent volume claim. I was able yeah. to resize it by manually modifying the storage class to allow auto to allow resizing, mm -hmm. um, which you you shouldn't ever do to manually modify that storage class. But if you do and then modify the persistent volume, uh, it shows up in the pod, but the persistent volume claim is upset because it's like, hey, this is this doesn't have the right um, storage class, so I shouldn't be allowed to resize this, and it complains to you. So I got in this ridiculous rabbit hole, and we ended up uh, deleting the PV and PVC in order to get past it, and now we're good. But I know there's got to be a better way to handle those situations, and preferably yeah. without Elastic. I actually think there's a flag on the PVC that says like allow volume resize or something. You yeah, can't allow set volume it to, expansion. Yeah, it's yeah. only available for certain storage classes and not for once it's in Terraform. Mm, interesting. Mm, interesting. What about, so, oh, that's, <laughs> that's what I was just about to say. I was wondering what happens if you poop cuddle edit and then like plan. It works. Like, yeah. you, that's what I did this morning. And, oh, and then if you plan like what if you plan that and then like update terraform to match what you did like manually there does that work i did the, you have to do terraform first because um yeah it, it works but you have to delete the pvc you can't modify the pvc oh uh, i got it too. which is okay i just in order to delete the pvc i need to like restart the service um and i was trying to do it with zero downtime uh so we're actually good now um but it took downtime so that i was hoping for a way to do it with that downtime so the other reason why we prescribe using EFS, and it's actually what we do it, and why it might not affect you if you did it this way, is that we change uh, by default. We change the default storage class on all the Kubernetes clusters to use EFS. So that way, out of the box, most things just work. It's charts that have been like explicitly hard coded to use something other than that that don't work, and that's probably not going to be your use case. The other reason is that um, when you're using EBS, uh, you're losing HA. So that pod is now zone locked. So if you lose a zone, you lose your Argo CD until that zone comes back online. But if you're using EFS, you're no longer zone locked and that pod can bounce around between zones. I'll add to that confusion. Uh, Argo CD is a stateless. Um, this is Go CD and our oh, okay. o, o U R Go CD and our Go CD are constantly used at our organization because we're using both of these tools together. Um, and it's hilarious. Uh, I've seen Flux work. I actually wouldn't recommend people adopt Go CD in the way we did, but seven years ago, it was the right tool for the job and we're still using it. Um, mm. Our Go CD has none of these issues. You're totally right. We're zone locked for, our, for, for the Go CD instance that we use for continuous deployment. Um, and it's a known deficit. Uh, it doesn't impact our end users. It just impacts deployments. So we've said, you know, we're comfortable with that. But you're right. If I use DFS, we would be able to remove that uh, risk, and that'd be pretty cool. The last observation I would say is, I can't imagine a scenario where you should ever really need to resize this for your organization ever, because like it's so cheap to just add add two terabytes, add five terabytes, whatever it is, and be done with it because the cost to your organization for you to fix this and go through all this was much greater than probably the cost. Are you saying the engineer who chose 10 gigabytes in the beginning was over <laughs> You might be right. You're totally right. Did I was that up to one terabyte? Yes. Yeah, was that the good. same guy that, you know, chose a, a slash 22 on your VPC? Uh, it was <laughs> 24 actually. I have some stuff that's there slash 24. It's... Yes, this is our business though, right? Lessons learned the hard way, we've all been there. Uh, only way to learn. Okay, uh, I am done with uh, pr uh, canned questions that were brought up. Uh, what other questions do we have? I see there's been some conversations in the chat here. Um, doesn't look like any other questions there. Yeah, anyone? I actually have one, Eric, if I can jump in. Yeah, nice, long time <laughs> and, no speak. Yeah, yeah it has, it has. I, I, I see this a reminder every week and i'm like god i gotta get back in there sometime but uh <laughs> so <laughs> this is not a I, I don't want to go into detail on this but a compatriot of mine and i uh want to experiment with something and we didn't know what we were getting into so i wanted to ask and if if we're about to get into something really ugly hopefully somebody will tell us we recently migrated to Office 365 for our infrastructure. 
And we wanted to look at how we could use that for authentication with Cognito in setting up some VPNs and VPCs. And I didn't know if anybody had experience with Office 365 and Cognito and then using that, you know, for authentication. And it, yeah. is this something we're going to really regret trying to implement? I can I can actually give you some some insight there. So uh, under the hood, uh, Office three sixty five uses Azure Azure AD, which is their like Azure Active Directory. That's like their uh, Microsoft's cloud version of Active Directory, um, and it fully supports uh, SAML and it supports it really well. So you should have like no problems integrating Cognito and any other third party services you want. Um, you know, to integrate with that, okay. like a lot, a lot of very large organizations uh, uh, use that because of their relationships, or existing relationships with Microsoft, and and needing Good. Microsoft Active Directory to be their source of truth of of identity for their users. So, um, I've seen a lot of people integrate to that really easily. So, um, I don't think you should have any problem doing so. Good. Good. Thanks. And I just want to do a call out or shout out just because yeah, it's sentimental. It means something to me. It's pretty cool. So Mike Crow, everyone, Mike <laughs> Crow sent me an email on Thursday, October 12th, 2017. So it's, uh, today is October 6th. That was the first person who ever reached out to Cloud Posse and just asked questions about UDSIC, which is one of our first uh, projects that we ever started. Uh, and uh, he just wanted to touch base and uh, give us a shout out that he thought it was really cool and wanted to learn more about what we were working <laughs> on over here. So thanks, Mike, for stopping by a few years later again. And Yeah, no problem. No problem. <laughs> I actually, I'm going to come back more because I, I love keeping up with this stuff. So, yeah. Nice. All right. Any other questions today? I'll throw out my crazy problem if no one has anything else that they want to talk about. Your, your Packer issue? Yeah. <laughs> okay, go for it. Let's do it. Uh, so um, I've been working on a project for a customer where uh, we're building, um, we built a bunch of custom base AMIs um, with Packer. Um, the AMIs are encrypted uh, using a KMS key that's in there's like a KMS key in each region. Um, the as the packer gets copied to each region, the, as the AMI gets copied to each region, it gets re-encrypted with that region's KMS key. Um, but now we've hit like a, a wall that no one can figure out what's going on. But that for some reason we can't find the right principle that needs access to that KMS key in order to spin up a new instance in the ASG, like in the auto scaling group. Um, it, for the life of me, I can't figure out what it is. I've used the auto scaling group service principle and given that access, I've given um, the, the, the actual user who's, who's applying that change access, uh, everything I can think of and we, it's still failing. Um, with an encrypted, basically saying it can't, it can't read the encrypted AMI. Um, just for giggles, uh, I created a non-encrypted AMI and verified like the entire thing works fine with an unencrypted AMI. So it's certainly, uh, the error message doesn't seem to be misleading, but um, it's kind of a head scratcher. Yeah, how to yeah. figure out the principle that it's try that is getting access denied. And there's nothing in, um, you know, in uh, cloud trails and, there's nothing getting logged anywhere. It just says like the instance failed to launch. So, hey Matt, question for you: Are you using um, CMKs, and then more specifically the bring your own key version? Um, not a bring your own, not your a bring your own key version, but we're we are using a specific key for Packer. Like it's it's made specifically for that using our KMS module, um, and then. You know, the, then we're using our EKS module to basically try to replace the AMI, um, you know, with the the new AMI that's encrypted, and that's when we're getting the error. Okay. And then, are you using it? Is the AMI created by the same AWS account, or is it going to another AWS account? It's going to another AWS account, but it's being um, 
it's ba- being re-encrypted basically like when it gets sent over there. And, and I should ah, okay. mention, I should mention that if I go to the console and I log on as an administrator, um, I can, I can launch this AMI, like in that storage group, the AMI runs it, it joins the EKS hmm. cluster. It does everything. It's just when we're yeah, trying to actually good. get the auto scaling group to huh. launch it, um, that we have this problem. So it's definitely not like something broken with the AMI or, you know, anything along those right. lines. It's, right. it's the, the actual like auto scale group. And I would have, I would have bet my life that the service principle for auto scaling in the in that account were was the thing that needed access to it. But sure enough, that's not that's not what <laughs> what's allowing it to work. So uh, I just didn't know if anyone might have any other ideas because I've I spent like way too long trying to figure this out and uh, and paired with a couple people on our team and none of us had any any other good options at this point. And you said you 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 tried using the principle of the um, the auto scaling principle itself, you know the iron where it's the very specific you know. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So and not only that, but I also used like the the it actually under the hood it assumes like another specific iron that's like AWS STS colon. Uh, assumed role slash auto scaling slash something. I even like dug out that role and tried giving it directly right. to that. And even that, you know, that didn't do it too. So I, I don't know. And every point, every place I've Googled seems to say just giving it to the auto scaling principle should work, but clearly it's not working. But right not now. the case. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and also I thought maybe I had the wrong like KMS permissions or something. So I gave that principle KMS dot splat, like dot, you know, all um, just to see if that would do it. And that also didn't do it. So right, I don't know right. if, if anyone comes up with any brilliant ideas, I, I'd welcome, uh, <laughs> I'd welcome some feedback, you know, certainly ping me in, uh, in one of the channels uh, and let me know if you think of anything, but it's uh it's been a head scratcher, this one. So I have a question uh, for everyone. Uh, it's a little open-ended. Uh, one of the things that I'm working on right now for uh, our team at Cloud Posse is kind of defining our uh, strategy uh, with customers around uh, SRE and incident management. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a thousand articles out there on the, the theory um, and, uh, you know, various implementations for Prometheus or Grafana and you know, Datadog has their academy um, with some good resources. Uh, I'm looking for practical write-ups on implementing SLOs, uh, practical write-ups for uh, implementing incident management uh, tied to SLOs or any you know, thing in between. Uh, I'm looking for what uh, are some, you know, uh, critical uh, services conceptually to monitor, things like, you know, lead time to deploy for CI, CD, um, you know, pull request throughputs and sprint throughputs, um, things like that. So if anyone has some great articles for me, please send them my way, put them in the Office Hours channel. Um, I'd like to read up on them. I've been having I've been having random thoughts lately of what the this is just a statement to throw out I I wonder what the economic in, uh, impact would be if like US East one disappeared <laughs> so much like seriously oh, like world economy like too big impacts. to fail yeah it yeah. is and and then uh, it, the whole Facebook like shooting themselves mm. in the foot thing uh, yeah. got me thinking about it again. And I was like, what if Amazon like does something that takes them like three days to get USC's one back? What, what would that, what would actually happen? And I was like, wow, that's, that's probably huge. I, the recent outages, uh, our team did a mini pre-mortem uh, and wrote a bunch of documentation on what to do if we get locked out of like our single sign-up provider. And we didn't have that prior to last week. Mm. Um, we kind of knew what it was in our heads, but we had enough turnover in the team that it was worth formally documenting in case some of us weren't available or to reduce it by a bus factor. Um, so it's always great when somebody else has an outage that prompts people to improve their disaster recovery. Uh, that happened to me this week. Yeah. I can give some insights on that and learn from a uh, failure. 
Uh, I guess my initial assumption about the, the outage was uh, BGP actually. Uh, I work with BGP before. BGP is a very tricky protocol and it takes time for advertise the prefix. I guess the, the acquisition of WhatsApp and Instagram and adding these uh, to the same autonomous system of Facebook and you know just go out from the same BGP prefix was a very bad design. Because when the, uh, the whole autonomous system goes down, the three surfaces goes down. So I'm not sure 100% if, if, if that's the case, but each surface should have its own, uh, its own BGP autonomous system, I guess. And uh, yeah, I've been reading about they lock themselves out because some of the security keys was using the internet. So they was, you know. <laughs> Then they need internet to gain access to doors and something like that. So that was, yeah, we should learn from that. I think uh, during the next few weeks, we will learn more about what happens. So I don't think AWS do the same design methodology, especially uh, uh, AWS, but, Amazon and Google, but for, you, you know. <laughs> yeah, but they following like SRE's best practices. So I'm not, I don't think they will ever, you know, just do something silly like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I was a network engineer early in my career. That's like where I came up. I was a Cisco CCIE. So I did a ton with, with like network protocols and BGP in, in particular. And we, we, I used to be on a team that ran like a network pairing point where we were doing like hundreds of gigabits per second of throughput like uh, between networks. And one of the habits I always got into was the first, when I was doing one of those changes is the first thing I would do is I would schedule my router to reload in 10 minutes, um, which would basically like <laughs> bring back the saved config. Then I would put in, I would put in my config and if it broke anything, the worst thing that would happen was we would have a 10 minute outage and then the router would reboot and load the saved config that I hadn't <laughs> yet saved. And then I would be back online and I could try my, my task again. So like, think about those little things when you make changes, like how can I get myself out of, you know, out of something that um, I'm never like, I can make it a, you know, a two-way door and not a one-way door that I'm walking through right now. Like when, and, and that's router. That's router stuff, but like you could find that with every every change that you're gonna make that might be like outage causing. So always think through that before you start. Yeah, we send we Eric, we should send Matt to Facebook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, he's too valuable. I I, I can't uh, lose this guy. All right, thank you everyone for your time today. I really appreciate the conversation. Uh, if you haven't yet checked out our YouTube channel, head over to youtubecom c posse to subscribe and get all of our past episodes as well as special outtakes from our office hours. If you haven't yet subscribed to our uh, office hours invitation, head over to cloudposse.com slash office hours to do that or join our Slack team at slack.cloudposse.com. Free for anyone to join. Uh, nearly 5,000 brilliant people there helping each other out. I'm always looking forward to connect with all of you via LinkedIn. So please hit me up at LinkedIn. Go to linkedin.com slash in slash Osterman and we'll connect there. Take care everyone. See you same place, same time next week.